you as a private citizen can strike back at communism. RFE's daily broadcasts reach these 80 millions, keeping alive their belief in the free world. A youngster in East Europe needs facts. He needs a mind of his own. He needs Radio Free Europe. Hello, you lucky people. Thank you for joining me once again in our live social studies uh, broadcast here. This is going to be uh, COVID video number four, I believe. Uh, we're on unit 5.4.2, so we're working on making that really confusing for you. Uh, that said, all right, so here's the deal. You guys have had me in the classroom now for like three quarters. You know that Mr. Walsh likes paper, uh, and the reason why I like paper is because it's a physical copy, and it's just easier to manage. Um, I haven't done a very good job of making sure all my stuff on Google Classroom is formatted in a way that you understand it so we're going to take just a few minutes from this video please listen to the whole thing so you understand how it works um, i've now learned how to share documents with you um, so everybody gets their own copy so now that i know how to do that thank you mara dorjan i really appreciate that helping us out with the, this afternoon uh, but what you guys need to do is take this copy obviously you can get to it when I post it and then you're going to work on that all by yourself and then you are going to turn that in and then I am going to turn that back to you after I write comments on it uh, that way I'm not hopping back from screen to screen and getting stuff out of different emails and everything like that so just make sure uh, if you have any questions over it you let me know uh, today you guys and, and really truly okay so let's talk deadlines for a second um, I'd say, you know, as a rule of thumb, you get the homework for me. Uh, you're going to get an assignment for me posted this evening, and hopefully one um, tomorrow. Actually, you'll get a you'll get an assignment for me tomorrow too. Uh, so, basically, those are going to be due by Sunday, April 12th. Uh, that's sort of the deadline that we have in place. Um, now, I understand, and everybody else does too, that we're all struggling to maintain some kind of you know, order and, and just, you know, this, these are not normal times. So uh, you get them done when you get them done. Let's think about, hey, I got the work to do. What, what can I do right now? Well, let's get our social studies done. Let's get our math done, whatever you need to do. But um, let's try to get these turned in and I can get feedback to you, you know, immediately. Remember that BBC video I made you guys watch? Well, uh, here's the struggle. I mean, we're all on different timelines right now. I've been working on school stuff all day, as has my wife. She's a school teacher as well. We haven't done any schoolwork with our kids, and it's uh, like a quarter till four on Tuesday afternoon. So tonight, that's what we're going to try to get done, a little bit of that, and have dinner and you know everything else that needs to be done around the house. So just make sure that you guys are kind of learning how to manage time and that we're not just, you know, working on other stuff all the time all right so um, I'll also put the textbook up on Google classroom uh, you guys have seen the assignment here uh, you're gonna describe some of the personalities and characteristics of uh, the people who traveled on the Oregon Trail and throughout the West uh, you may describe actual people who are known by name so people that I've talked about or people that you see in the notes uh, we're gonna have some some textbook stuff there too of course that that are there or you may describe a nameless person who participated in the event so what skills would they need to be successful? Uh, what skills would they have? Or what skills would they need to be successful? How did teamwork impact the success of the trip? What would they say? What would they see in different geographic regions that they traveled through? And be sure to include information about the difficulties that the settlers experienced. So you guys know me. It's we're on like the fourth quarter together. Uh, I'd say no more than three paragraphs. I don't want to read more than three paragraphs per student. So two to three. Uh, you've got an introduction. This is what we're going to talk about. Main body, where we have facts, uh, and then a conclusion. And your conclusion can, you know, really be however you want to end it. Just make sure that we've answered those questions that you have up there above uh, in the directions, so uh, you kind of follow a follow a format. At least points you in the right direction. Uh, work on it. Get it done. If you have any questions, you guys know you can email me. Um, I get back to those all the time. Uh, some of you are still continuing to turn in stuff from last week. Hey, more power to you. Better late than never. Let's get it all done. Let's get caught up. Let's all be on the same page. All right. So, um, you know, it's been kind of a stressful time, I think, you know, for everybody involved in this whole thing. And, and really, if, if all we have to worry about right now is school, 
and doing our jobs and being students and being teachers, then we've got it. We've got it pretty good. So um, make sure, like I said, let's get this stuff done to me as soon as you can. Um, April twelfth, that's Sunday. That's the the, the deadline. Uh, get it in before then. Then I can write some comments on it and get it back to you. So uh, yeah, I'm marking it as uh, complete or uh, incomplete on uh, teacher ease, and that's that's where you'll find where you need to get caught up. All right, so uh, let's get into kind of what we're going to talk about, westward expansion. Remember, we talked about Manifest Destiny in our last lesson. Uh, but you have to remember that a lot of the people that are heading west uh, are going to be Christian missionaries. In fact, Christian missionaries of a lot of different Protestant denominations, Methodists, Presbyterians. Uh, there's a lot of other different religious denominations that are heading out there as well. But these are the spearheads, really, of, of settlement by the United States, that in the military and the fur traders. Uh, there's a few people here. This is a primary source that we're, we're looking at. This was done uh, basically almost like a coloring book. There's stories out of the Bible. Remember, the Native Americans are, are as a general rule of thumb, not literate. Uh, so this explains sort of the basic uh, theology there of Christianity. Uh, they're going to be, like I said, lots of people that head west. Uh, they're going to be these small outposts that are going to be maintained by the U.S. Army. Uh, you have to remember these are trading outposts. So like Fort Laramie here in Wyoming, uh, you have Native Americans surrounding the fort, you know, just grazing and, and following the bison herds or the buffalo herds and uh, taking advantage of all the stuff that the uh, United States can trade them, like weapons and iron tools and all sorts of things. Uh, that make people's lives easier. So you have all these people that are settling across the West. Uh, they're following the trails that the trappers had let out. That's going to become you know, known as the Oregon Trail. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Dr. Whitman. He's from New England, and he was a Christian minister. And uh, he was also you know, a doctor, and he helped Jim Bridger when Jim Bridger had a metal arrow stuck in his back. So he performed some, some surgery there, probably without any anesthesia. Well, uh, Dr. Whitman is going to be settling in Oregon country with his wife, a woman by the name of uh, Narcissa, and her maiden name was Narcissa, Pres uh, Narcissa Prentice. Uh, but before leaving for Oregon on what was going to be an 11-year mission trip, uh, Narcissa wrote, Yes, my native land, I love thee. All they scenes, I love them well. Friends, connections, happy country. Now I bid you all farewell. Uh, so because of the fact that you have a super underdeveloped transportation network, uh, you know, letters are going to be few and far between. Rarely are you going to see uh, the people in your family once you make the decision to head west. Uh, in fact, you know, when you deal with you know, older family members, grandparents, things like that, you know, over the course of a lifetime, you start heading west, uh, that'll probably be the last you ever see of them. The Whitmans are going to set up a mission in Oregon, and they're going to be uh, dealing with a tribe called the Cayuse. And the Cayuse were uh, a group of Native Americans that were settling there in the you know, what's called uh, the Oregon Valley, the Oregon Territory. And, uh, you know, Dr. Whitman and his wife are going to be involved in this terrible incident uh, that sort of defines what we know about uh, Native Americans and, and, and the westward expansion um, in its most negative sense. The Whitmans had basically, like we said, settled around the Cayuse. Uh, they'd attempted some missionary work with them, but you also have to remember that these people are, are traders with goods, and um, they're working you know, pretty, in pretty close proximity to the Cayuse. Well, uh, you know, biological problems have been around for a really long time. People just didn't understand how they worked. Uh, it's believed that the, uh, well, the Native Americans having no immunity to all sorts of diseases that you're going to find in people from the United States, uh, the Cayuse are going to be hit by the measles so hard, in fact, it's going to kill uh, most of their children. And the Cayuse, you know, not necessarily understanding how biology works in a modern sense, uh, you know, they weren't sick before the white people showed up. The white people are here now, and we're all dying, so it becomes an issue of, of cause and effect. Well, uh, the Cayuse are going to attack the Whitman mission, and they are going to uh, kill a large number of people. In fact, there are going to be 13 victims in that whole thing. Both Dr. Whitman and his wife are going to be slain, uh, as well as some children. Uh, in fact, Jim Bridger, not only had uh, Jim Bridger gotten his 
himself worked on there by Dr. Whitman. He also had left one of his daughters with the Whitman family as well. Now, fortunately for Jim Bridger and her, she uh, actually spends time with the Cayuse. There's going to be a war, obviously, that starts up over this where, uh, and this all goes down in 1847, which there's a lot of stuff happening in 1847. Uh, but she's going to be kidnapped and kept by the Cayuse for a number of months and is going to later write about her experiences. And uh, the Whitman Massacre becomes a really big part of the folklore of the West. And there's a lot of, you know, disinformation, but yet a lot of primary sources, a lot of a lot of secondary sources out there, all kinds of things that are, are written about it because uh, it's, you know, such a horrific and shocking thing. Well, uh, like we said, there's a lot of different reasons that people are going west. You saw the picture there of Ann Pittman uh, there in 1838. Uh, she's married to a guy by the name of Jason Lee. She'd never seen him before, so she has that uh, portrait painted for her parents. And uh, she heads out and dies uh, in childbirth you know, two years later. Uh, so sort of a rough and tumble life out there on the frontier that we've seen so far. Well, why are so many people making the trip? Uh, well, a lot of it goes back to the Jacksonian era that we've been talking about before in the 1830s. Uh, Andrew Jackson had a problem with the National Bank. Uh, we all know that there's a lot of economic stuff that would take a really, you know, long turn of, of events to explain in, in, in full. But it's anytime you have a recession and a depression. Uh, the panic of 1837 is going to go on for a really long time. I mean, it's going to go on for years and years. Uh, in fact, the Democrats are going to lose the White House in the 1840 election. There's going to be a president by the name, well, we've heard this name before, uh, William Henry Harrison, who had won some battles over Tecumseh there, or at least Tecumseh's brother at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Well, he's going to run for president as a Whig, and his home state is going to be Ohio. And his campaign slogan was Tippecanoe and Tyler too, and that is in reference to his vice presidential running mate, a guy by the name of John Tyler from Virginia. So Harrison is this, you know, elderly war hero who gets elected here in the 1840 election, and he's going to contract pneumonia, and he's going to die one month later. Uh, his vice president, of course, John Tyler, is now going to take over. So we've had a president now die in office, and we have, you know, his, his wingman coming in there to, to step up. Well, you've got James Polk's election in 1844. So we've, he's a Democrat from Tennessee. He's cut from the same cloth as Andrew Jackson. We've, we've kind of talked about those, those kind of characters. Uh, so in the 1844 election, we see the Democrats taking the White House. And there's going to be a lot of stuff we're going to talk about tomorrow uh, with Mexico that, that comes out about this. So William Henry Harrison passes away. He dies of pneumonia after contracting it on his inauguration day. And President John Tyler is going to be a one and done. So he's a he's a one term president. And we'll talk more about Mr. Polk tomorrow. So all this economic activity. I mean, there's a lot of cartoons that are going to lay this whole horrible depression right at the feet of Andrew Jackson and the Democrats. And you kind of see that with the Oval Office changing hands. But there are going to be a lot of people that are going to decide to start over. Uh, that business opportunities or, or you know, just a way of life uh, wasn't working out for them. And so they packed up the family and they headed out west. And the idea that Oregon and later California are to be these promised lands of fertile soil and, and you know, just all there for the taking. If you can, you know, get overland and survive the trip and not have to deal with Native Americans, uh, it's, you know, you could make a fortune. Uh, and it's also the mentality of the people. I mean, these were a, a frontier people. You've, you've got the ancestors of a lot of you know, important people from, you know, Kentucky and the Midwest. You know, the Lincolns are a perfect example. Pretty much any family that came to this region in the 18, you know, early 1800s, they're going to be following a, almost a family tradition of packing up and moving the frontier westward. You know, every every generation. So there's there's a lot of different reasons why people people go. So there's going to be this thing called the Great Migration of 1843. And the, the real thing that kind of strikes at the heart of the Great Migration of 1843 is uh, this notion that um, there's all this land there in Oregon that's absolutely beautiful and it has to be 
the United States is for the taking. I mean, back to Manifest Destiny. Uh, we have to remember the United States is competing with Great Britain in a massive way. Russia's already up there, too, around Alaska and Hawaii. So if we can have American settlers out there claiming that frontier for the United States and, you know, building their personal fortunes through hard work and, you know, agriculture and all that, then by golly, let's let's motivate some people to go. And uh, the reason why they call it the Great Migration of 1843 is that they're going to be 200 families, okay? This is going to start off, you know, it's not a flood, it's, it's not a trickle, 200 families, all their wagons, so you've got, you know, all these people, about 1,000 people and 120 wagons, uh, you know, heading westward across the frontier. That's a, that's a large group of people, uh, but we're going to see, you know, through this little lesson here on the Oregon Trail just how, how, how it worked out, so... This is a book um, from a library long, long ago. It's from the American Heritage Junior Library. Uh, but this is called Westward on the Oregon Trail. And this book uh, is a nice little resource here. You, you've got, uh, you don't really have books that are, I think, made with, you know, just kind of like beautiful color photos uh, of paintings, rather, inside. Uh, that's where I get a lot of this stuff from, or at least get sent on the right path to find, you know, a particular artist or photo photographer. Uh, but this is copyrighted in 1962, so the language is a little bit dated, but it's going to give us a pretty good idea of what families um, went through and, and how this, this whole thing gets started. So uh, just follow along, children. It's going to be a lovely, lovely journey. A festive air enlivened the covered wagon encampment near Independence, Missouri, on the morning of May 22, 1843. The prairie schooners, bright with fresh paint and white canvas tops, sparkled in the spring sunshine. While the menfolk pinned the yokes to the ox teams, the women snuffed out the cook fires. Children and dogs raced about, scattering chickens, jumping over churns and wagon tongues, and playing hide-and-seek behind the huge wheels. All seemed confusion until a man's voice rang out above the racket. Turn out! Turn out! A great cheer burst forth. Oregon or bust! The men shouted in answer. Some fired guns skyward in sheer exuberance. Others hastily stowed the remaining belongings in their wagons. Women climbed onto the high seats and reached for toddlers handed up to them. Older children scrambled up behind their parents or jostled for position at the rear to peer out through the puckered openings in the canvas. A guide waved his hat and pointed westward towards Oregon, the promised land. As the teams of lead wagons laid into their yokes, the great iron-tired wheels rolled slowly forward. One after another, the wagons moved out onto an ocean of green prairie. The great adventure began in sunshine and song. It ended 2,000 miles and five months later as the weary travelers dragged to a halt on the banks of the Great Columbia River. From Missouri to Oregon, this advanced train of the Great Migration of 1843 and the scores of caravans and the flood tide of settlement to follow rolled over a well-worn trail. Landmarks named by grizzled trappers and campgrounds of earlier roadmakers were their guideposts. None except for the scouts, called pilots then, knew anything about the trip. None could predict what one immigrant called the 10,000 little vexations of covered wagon travel. For the children and the younger people, the journey was a long, exciting picnic. For some of the ailing and elderly, it meant a trailside grave. For farmers, merchants, and crafty adventurers, the exhausting labor, the suffering, and the danger seemed worth the risk if, in the end, they all prospered. The travelers would see prairies, deserts, mountains, and Indians like none had ever seen along the Mississippi or eastward. They would savor the wild taste of antelope and buffalo meat, cower under cannonading thunder and lightning storms, stand off buffalo stampedes, and exclaim over bold sunsets and acres of wild flowers. They would throw snowballs in August, sing, dance, and pray around crackling bonfires, and pit their ordinary strength and courage against the harsh land and fearful weather. Geography dictated the route along the Oregon Trail, and the geography of the West included nearly every sort of terrain imaginable. At its beginning, the trail was easy enough going. From the jumping-off places on the Missouri River, it angled off to the northwest, crossing the Kansas River and following its tributary, the Blue to the valley of the Platte River. From the line of bluffs called the coast of Nebraska could be seen a level grassy valley 20 miles wide, divided by the wide, shallow, lazy flowing Platte. The bottom land was scarred with narrow paths, worn by thousands upon thousands of buffalo moving to water. 
there were no trees. After the forks of the Platte were reached, the road became more difficult. The crossing of the South Platte, swift flowing and treacherous with quicksand, brought tragedy to many a party. The trail followed the North Platte, the, distance, the distant dunes broken by jutted, fragmented formations. Courthouse Rock, Chimney Rock, and Scott's Bluff were as much signposts as Main or Elm Street back east. Fort Laramie in southeastern Wyoming was the first station on the trail where immigrants rested and exclaimed over the snow-capped Laramie Peak bristling upon the horizon. Here, they could pick up news of the trail ahead and enjoy, as one traveler described it, the welcome pleasures of a room upstairs, which looked very much like a bar room of an eastern hotel. Moving steadily upward into the foothills of the Rockies, the trail left the North Platte and followed the Sweetwater River. The bulky turtle back of Independence Rock, one of the most famous landmarks of the trail, loomed up to be followed by a forbidding gorge known as the Devil's Gate. Days of steadily pulling up Sweetwater's banks brought the trail to the crest of the Continental Divide and South Pass, the summit gateway for wagons crossing the Rocky Mountains. Beyond the rivers flowed to the Pacific. As important as it was, South Pass was not the dramatic, spectacular cut through towering peaks that most immigrants had imagined. One of them complained that if you didn't know it was the mountain pass, you wouldn't know it from any other place. The way was downhill now, but no less difficult. The Little Sandy and the Big Sandy Rivers led to the beautiful Green River Valley. This had once been the heart of beaver country, but by the time wagons rolled to Oregon, it was almost trapped out. The trail turned northwest into present-day Idaho. At Soda Springs, children spilled from the wagon and drank effervescent wa effervescing water that tickled their noses. Nearby Steamboat Springs, they discovered, really did sound like the steamboats that chuffed up the Missouri and Mississippi and Ohio rivers back home. Here the road angled sharply to the north, across a hot, dry, sagebrush-covered plain. Drooping spirits brightened once the whitewashed walls of Fort Hall came into sight on the Snake River. The fort provided another welcome touch. The fort provided another welcome touch of civilization, no matter how primitive. California, as well as Oregon, held to be a promised land, and near Fort Hall, those taking the California Trail turned southwest. They had scorching deserts and the snow-covered ramparts of the Sierra Nevada range to face before reaching their goal. Those bound for Oregon continued northward, their next stop, Fort Boise. The trail wound through the Snake River country, a rocky, sandy, parched landscape that seemed to belong more on the moon than on the earth. After Fort Boise, the Idaho mountains closed in, with snow powdering the higher slopes and threatening lagging parties with the horrors of being marooned for the winter. The final barrier was the Blue Mountains, a trial for exhausted men and animals. At last came Fort Walla Walla and the Columbia River. Here was the promised land. The last leg of the journey was made by boat, from either Fort Walla Walla or the Dalas, a series of rapids in the Columbia. South of the Columbia up to the Wilmette, their long track ended. In the lush Wilmette Valley, they felled trees and raised their cabins, and their plows bit deeply into the soil. The majority of the immigrant parties had a relatively safe passage when compared to the dangers and hardships experienced by those whose moccasins or horses had marked out the Oregon Trail. The long, ponderous caravans had maps and wheel ruts to guide them and wilderness, force, and wilderness forts to ease their needs. Most men and guns enough to stand off Indians and build roads. All these advantages had been wrought for them at great cost in human life and suffering. Yet... Even though the trail had been broken and marked, there was never an easy decision for a man to load his wife and children and all his belongings into a wagon and set out across the endless miles of raw and untamed wilderness. It was a hard and unforgiving land they had to cross, and the cost was high. It has been estimated that in the pioneering years, the trail west took the lives of some 34,000 people, 17 for every mile. A man who went west in 1843 wrote this of his fellow immigrants. They have undertaken to perform, with slow-moving oxen, a journey of 2,000 miles. The way lies over trackless wastes, wide and deep rivers, rugged and lofty mountains, and is beset with hostile savages. Yet, they are always found ready and equal to the occasion, and always conquerors. May we not call them men of destiny? Well, uh, you know, that kind of gives us a, at least a, a rather visual and somewhat poetic insight into the whole um, 
Oregon Trail question there. So in your notes, you'll see that we've kind of got it laid out. Uh, the, the different phases, there are about nine different things that go on. You know, leaving Independence, Missouri to avoid the spring mud. That's really big. And, of course, you, you're a race. Uh, base, you're in a race, basically, against Mother Nature as soon as you take off. You've got to get over the mountains there in uh, both, you know, the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas. you got to get over those before winter sets in. Uh, there's lots of landmarks along the way. Uh, you've got, you know, Chimney Rock and Scott's Bluff there in Nebraska. There's a lot of great, you know, primary sources, if you can call them that, that are, are made during the time of the Oregon Trail. This is a painting by a American painter named Alpha, Alfred Jacob Miller, and it's a prairie scene, and you can kind of get a sense of uh, the wagon train moving out. Kind of, you know, he was there uh, really before the Oregon Trail was an established thing in the 1840s. He had traveled through uh, about a decade earlier. So, uh, you know, the trail starts off, you leave Independence, Missouri, you're heading across the prairie, it seems like it's a, you know, pretty flat and level trip, uh, but then, you know, they talked about trying to get through there at, uh, you know, things would have been easy going, you've got the family here, this is a painting by a guy named Albert Bierstad, and, the, you know, shows the family here gathered around the campfire for the night, uh, obviously everybody feels pretty safe, we don't have the wagons circled up for uh, fear of being attacked by... For fear of being attacked by the natives and we've got for oregon written on the side of the wagon there uh these families that made the trip you know a lot of times they weren't just traveling by themselves they would hire a lot of younger guys that would have been farm hands back east that would have been you know strong and ready to have an adventure and and have a reason and a way to get to oregon uh, these guys are going to be taking care of the livestock just a massive amount of physical labor that needs to be done every day, maintenance and, and all that. Um, you know, these people are going to be constantly taking care of the animals because their livelihood depends on them. Uh, of course, you know, cooking a meal, it's a rather long process of getting everybody gathered around, getting the supplies. Uh, but suffice to say that when you, you kind of follow the trip, uh, if people had planned well and had prepared, they're, they're going to eat, uh, fairly well of course this trip is going to take them uh you know through these landmarks there as they make their way across nebraska uh you, you've got to deal with you know rivers that are uh, wide and and they're shallow or maybe they're deep you don't really know what you're getting into of course uh as time goes on these fords will be marked uh, you've got a lot of fascinating geography you know you can imagine having never seen uh, a photograph of this stuff before uh, well hi there hi Piper, can you say hello to the camera? Can you say hello? Here. Can you say hello? Come here. Come up here. Come here. Of course, she's not going to jump up on me now because I'm asking her to. Hi. Hi. Okay. Let's, let's here. Can you get up here? Hi. Hi. Hi, you. Hello. Can you stand up? Can you stand up? All right, uh, Daddy's got to work. Okay, got to go work. So, go back, go to your home, or you can hang out in here. I don't care. It's kind of warm with the lights and the, yeah, go hang out there. All right, so Chimney Rock, you can kind of imagine, you know, having never seen uh, photographs or you know maybe paintings of this whole thing. Um, this is just sort of the you know geographic remnants of prehistory here in the western side of Nebraska. It's really pretty stuff. You've got Scott's Bluff. That was another landmark. Uh, you know, all this stuff would have been, uh, you know, kind of things that would have been noted by various people. Uh, you also have, you know, paintings and, and all that. Photography is a, a, a really big one. Uh, this is called uh, Jail and Courthouse uh, Rock there. So you've got the jail and you've got the courthouse. Um, what looked maybe to the people like a jail in a courthouse. There's some really fascinating, uh, this is jail rock, some really fascinating Western photography. This is done in 1897, so it's a, a little bit more 20th century, but the, the detail of the rock there and just, you know, what a massive, you know, geographic feature it is. Uh, you've got the, uh, the Devil's Gate that they're going to pass through. This is a, a photograph taken by somebody there in 1858, so right before the American Civil War. And you can see the guys kind of standing out there in, in their, their outfits. Uh, they've got the broad-brimmed hats. They've got their rifles or their 
muskets with him, probably rifles by 1858. Um, one of my favorite people that I want to work uh, on someday is a guy by the name of William Henry Jackson. And this is a photograph that he made in 18, I think it was uh, probably 1869, 1870. Anyways, he did a lot of work, uh, a lot of photography out there in the American West in the 1870s and the 1880s and is a really fascinating person that I'll, I'll blabber on about more uh, later on. So uh, lots of you know geography, lots of cool stuff to see, and uh, the trip would have just been getting more and more difficult as they made their way further into the Rocky Mountains. And you can kind of imagine, you know, as they, they, they pass things um, like, you know, Independence Rock and, and, and all that, uh, where a lot of people have, you know, signed their names. It hasn't changed much over the years. Uh, but as they, they get into the Rocky Mountains, you can kind of think about, you know, you see the, the rising of the, the, the horizon in front of you, and you see that, you know, you're getting closer and closer, but they're, they're traveling, you know, fairly, fairly slow. And, you know, you see these things, and they just get larger and larger and larger. And so, you know, you kind of have this modern painting here of a family making their way over the, over the, uh, the hills there towards the Rocky Mountains. It's kind of a kind of a picturesque scene. One of the things that's really scary is that, you know, these wagons are going to be going up and down these hills and the children and really anybody is going to be walking alongside them. And there are these horrific stories about children getting uh, rolled up into the wheels and being crushed to death and, you know, livestock and everything else becoming trapped as well. So it's a dangerous thing. And like the, the reading, the reading said, you have quite a few people that are going to pass away uh, on on this adventure, on this trek west. Of course, we've heard the term, we've heard the expression circling the wagons. Well, that was a way that Native Americans uh, could be fended off at night if everybody had their, their rifles and people, of course, are standing watch. Uh, not only do you have to worry about Native Americans, but you also have to worry about Mother Nature and talked a lot about, you know, tornadoes, thunderstorms. I mean, fierce, fierce stuff. And then, of course, there's always, there's always crossing, crossing the rivers. Uh, the buffalo, another thing that was rather risky is that, you know, the, the herds of buffalo during this time, the herds of buffalo, uh, at the start of the 1800s are going to number like 50 million. So, um, you're going to have these massive herds of animals just kind of going their own way and looking for water. And there's going to be a real danger of stampeding buffalo. Well, as time goes on, that becomes less and less. This is a picture from the 1870s there as the Native Americans uh, lose their major food source, their major way of life. Uh, there are only going to be um, about 150,000 buffalo that are alive today, or bison. And uh, these, you know, these are basically, uh, they're basically an endangered species. Um, and that was all, that was all done intentionally by the United States, by the way. That was all done with the purpose of making farmers out of the natives. Of course, uh, reaching the Rocky Mountains, getting over there. Some of these pictures are really fascinating. This looks to be like a little bit more of a modern photograph, and by modern, I mean uh, we kind of see, you know, some some coats that are cut there on the on the boy, the, the young you know, teenage son there. His coat looks a little modern, but, uh, you know, determined people nonetheless making their way west uh, on the Oregon Trail and the California Trail. Uh, other photographs here, some, some fascinating stuff. These are, you know, all primary sources. These are all families that are heading out. Uh, photography's moved up to this thing called the daguerreotype, and uh, you're going to have a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of visual records now. I mean, the, kind of a cool picture here that I, I got from the, um, the archives. You can see the page there, the seam in the page. Uh, but the look of determination on these people's faces, I mean, granted, people didn't smile when they took paint, uh, they took photographs back then because it, it, it took long, it took a long time to develop a picture. Uh, but you know, her, got her shirt there and it doesn't match her dress, but you know, they've made it over the, uh, Rocky mountains and into Oregon country and, and life is good. And they, they've made, made it successfully. And, you know, you look at their kids and, uh, you know, we've got quite a few, quite a few mouths to feed in that picture. So their, their journey's not done. Um, the wagon ruts of the Oregon Trail, some of them are still there. Um, you know, 
it's still a visual thing. You got to remember this is a natural highway, so you're going to have you know all around the South Pass and along the various rivers. Uh, you're going to have railroads and highways and interstates and all that. Um, talking about getting over the Rocky Mountains before winter, um, there's the story of the Donner Party, and this has been one of the most covered and talked about episodes. Uh, really in the history of the West. Uh, the issue of the Donner Party happens there in 1846, so a year before the Whitman family was killed up there in Oregon by the Cayuse tribe. Uh, but these people are going to leave Springfield, Illinois. In fact, uh, Abraham Lincoln has a small role in this story. But they're going to leave uh, basically there in the spring of 1846, and it's going to be one of those trips where you know it starts off okay, and then it all the climate then and then it all um, disintegrates rapidly. This is a book written by Michael Wallace, "The Best Land Under Heaven: The Donner Party and the Age of Manifest Destiny." So I highly suggest uh, if you're looking for a pretty good read. Now it's 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 not uh, you know it clocks in at about oh clocks in at about. 358 pages, but it talks a lot about the the nitty gritty of the detail. I mean, there's a murder in this story. Uh, you've got the Reeds; they're a family. They play a, a big role uh, in all this. And if you, you know anything about the the Donner Party, just to give you a quick synopsis of what happens, they 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 read a book like people tell you to do, and that book is written by somebody who really doesn't have a good grasp of the dangers of crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains there just after you know you get across the great deserts of Utah uh, and Nevada then you have to go over these 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 mountains and these mountains are wicked I mean these mountains are really beautiful but they are uh, they're not a place that you're going to be able to get in and out of very easily so they're going to get trapped there uh, there's a lot of reasons why they get trapped uh, they don't bring along um well, they, 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 the, sh the shortcut uh, that, in fact, Jim Bridger told him would have worked, uh, but, you know, that's, that's Jim Bridger. He's, he's done this for, for his whole life. Um, they, they wind up, they wind up uh, basically getting, the, how to put this, there are a lot of different rivalries within the Donner Party. Like I said, there's another family named the Reeds, and there's, there's going to be a murder, and they know they're going too slow. They start to panic. Uh, people won't get out of the way. Hey, maybe we should take this other path over here. And basically, everybody gets separated. And it's kind of one of those things where there's strength in numbers, but it also means that you're going to move slower. And everybody kind of just, well, it starts to snow, and they don't have a choice. They can't move. Uh, so the story basically ends with uh, the 89 people that are in the party. Uh, 45 of them are going to be all that's left. And there's, you know, kind of the story there that there's cannibalism that's practiced um, by a lot of these people in order to survive. And that was totally true. I mean, these people were on death's door. Uh, there's going to be, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet of snow. Uh, looking at, you know, Donner Lake today, uh, over there on the right-hand side of the photograph as you're kind of moving down, that's a, that's a, those are railway tunnels. Uh, the, the, the railroad still has... Uh, these tunnels that are built because they, they, they get so much snow up there that they have to keep operating the trains. And this whole area is just known for really intense and deep snowstorms throughout the winter months. Uh, so the Donner Party gets trapped there. And that's a, a really fascinating story. Like I said, there's so much going on uh, in American history there in 1845, 1846, 1847. We've got, uh, you know, War with Mexico, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. We have uh, the California Gold Rush. Everything's basically in play there. Uh, you've got you know a guy by the name of John Sutter uh, out there from Switzerland, uh, making fame and fortune around what becomes known as Sacramento, California. And uh, you just have so much stuff happening, and, and the Donner Party is just one you know basic chapter of that whole time period. Uh, but the last thing we'll look at there is our graph, you know, the estimated California, Oregon, and Mormon trail immigrants. We're going to talk about the Mormons tomorrow. Uh, but the numbers will start to rise really dramatically to a point that, you know, you kind of see it um, 
there's sometimes it levels off. Obviously, you've got less people going to Oregon there in 1849 because of the gold rush uh, and 25,000 people arriving in California and 44,000 people uh, the following year in 1850. Uh, look at how many people, you know, people just really don't stop going to California there until 1853. And then, I mean, even then it grows uh, there in 1859 at 17,000 people arriving. Uh, the Mormons, we're going to see them. They show up in in you know, two kind of waves there in 1847, 1848. Uh, we'll take a look at that later. But um, Oregon is just going to grow pretty consistently. And the numbers of people that are going to be traveling, uh, you know, are kind of off and on year by year. But for the most part, uh, it's going to be fairly steady growth uh, until it's eclipsed by California. So all that being said, uh, you guys have your assignment. So you've taken what I've said, you've taken what are in the notes, and I'll post you know, the textbook up there as well. Uh, but you guys have your three, two to three paragraphs. I don't want you to stress out about this. You've done this for me um, many times over this past year, and I expect you guys just to do a good job on that. And proofread your stuff before you send it. That um, just makes it easier to read. That's kind of the goal. I like easy. Uh, so with that, I will sign off and hopefully have a second video that you can watch this week uh, in the mix. So have a good day.